Hey everybody, welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Mamiya RB67 Professional. This video is gonna go over everything about how to use this camera so that by the time we're done with this video, you'll understand all of the functions and everything that this camera is trying to tell you. It's a really complex camera, so if there's a specific thing you need to know, check the video description below, and there's an index with timestamps to take you to that specific part of the video. First thing we're gonna talk about is how to mount and unmount the lenses. The first thing you need to know is that the camera's shutter has to be cocked in order for the lenses to be taken off and put on. So if you have a lens on here, just grab this breech mounting ring here and turn it counter or anti-clockwise until these two red dots line up here, and then you can just take it off. And then if you have another lens, all you have to do is line up the two red dots and then turn the breech lock clockwise, and now it's locked and ready to go. If you are going to store your lenses for a period of time, you need to make sure that they are triggered so that they don't, uh, so that this, right now there is tension on the springs in this lens. Anytime that the pins here are lined up with the green, there's tension on, this, on, the, tr on the lens. So you wanna take that off if you're gonna store it. Push down this button right here, and those two and turn, and you can see that everything has stopped down. That's taken the tension off of the springs, and now you can set this off to the side and store it, and it won't ruin your camera's timing having it in storage. When, when your tr lens is armed, when the shutter's armed, there's tension under the springs that they're being pulled on. And if you store them like that, they'll develop a memory in that position, and the shutter timing won't be as accurate as it should be. Uh, so it's a good idea to store them with tension off. Loading film in the RB67 is pretty easy. I'm going to show you a couple of different um, types of film back and how to load film into them. Here is the standard Pro S film back. I don't think I have any of the original Pro film backs. To load film, you're simply going to open it up. We'll take the caddy out because that does make it a little bit easier. There's a little button right here. You're going to push down on it on it and then you can rotate or angle the film spool out. That button depresses this retainer right here. And so when you push it, you want to angle out from the bottom. Over here, we're gonna do the opposite. We're going to push down on this button to, to put that re retainer in the bottom. We're gonna angle this in from the top and there we go. And now we're gonna advance the film advance until the slot from the 120 spool is over on this side. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab a spool of old film for this demonstration, but you would wanna use new film if possible. The film goes in a little bit counterintuitively and I'll show you why. You wanna load it the opposite of how you unloaded the spool before. Now that you have it loaded this way, you wanna pull it out and proper loading has the black part of the paper like this. If the paper's turned around and you're seeing the yellow when you pull out, like pull the tab out, you've loaded the film backwards. So you want to have the black facing the same direction as the film pressure plate right here. I'm going to pull it around, feed it into the slot on the take-up spool, and we'll advance. There we go. Now we'll advance until there. There's arrows right here on the film and they line up with a little arrow right there on the bottom of the film back. Next thing we're gonna do is put the caddy back into the film back. We're gonna close the film back and, and lock it. And now we advance until we see a number one in the window there. There we go, number one. So I'm gonna do something you should never do and I'm gonna show you proof that we've loaded it correctly. Now you can see the film emulsion underneath the dark slide. Film is one and done, so once you load it into your camera, don't open the back, don't take the dark slide off until the, the, camera, the film back is mounted on the camera. Once this film back is mounted on the camera, it's safe to take the dark slide off. I'm gonna sh but now I'm gonna do exactly what I told you not to do, and I'm gonna open the back and I'm gonna show you what's happening inside of here. As you take pictures and you advance the film, the film will be pulled along here from the uh, fresh spool and taken up on the new spool. So let me take 12 quick or 10 quick photos with the 
RB67 and I'll show you how to take the film out of the camera. So as I take these photos, one thing you can notice here in the window is that a little red dealy pops up after you've taken the photo and until you finish your advance. If you see that red thing in there, that's your double exposure warning, letting you know that you haven't advanced the film and you need to before you take your next photo. Once you get to the end, then you can just advance until you hit the end of the roll, which I should have by now. So we'll take the film back off again, we'll open it up, and you can now see that the, the film has completely been taken up by the take-up spool. So we'll take this off, we'll fold that under, and then you'll seal, well, we won't seal this one. But if your film wasn't 40 years expired, you then just seal this shut, put it in your bag or your pocket, and send it off to be developed or develop it yourself. Then you take the spool that you just loaded, put it in this side, put it inside. There we go. And you're ready to go to load your next roll of film or set this off to the side if you're done shooting with it for the day. That's how the standard film back works. There's another type of film back here, and it uses four AA batteries. Oh yeah, they go in this part right here. And there's a guide inside of it to tell you how to load them. There we go. Just gonna maybe try putting it in the right way. The battery pack is, a, the, the motorized film back is a little bit more challenging to use because if you want to do multiple exposures, you have to have it set to multi-exposure. Otherwise, um, it'll just automatically advance. And if you're going to use mirror up, mirror lockup, or t and time, you need to set it to that dial right there. So first thing we're going to do is turn it on and we'll check the batteries. You might not be able to see that, but there's a little red light turning on, which lets me know that, that it's working. I have AA batteries in there, so if you use AA, you want to hit the LR battery, or LR button. I'm going to open up the back here, and we'll take out the caddy, which as you can see is somewhat more complicated. We have the film and the take-up spool already. To load the film that's going to be fed through the camera, it's a similar process, but because this doesn't depress it, it angles out. You want to load it in here and then angle it into the top as well. There we go. Now we've loaded the film into the motor drive back. We'll take out our leader. We're going to pull it through here, feed it into the take-up spool, and then there's a, a directional arrow on the winder, and we're just going to wind it until these arrows here line up with the red arrow in the bottom of the film back. There we go. We'll drop it back inside of the film back itself. Should just work if we hit the start button. Did not like there. Then we hold down the start button. And now it's automatically advanced the film to where it needs to be. We can tell by this little dot right here that we have 120 film in. This, as far as I know, automatically detects, but since I've 220 is out of production. Uh, that should always be white. And now, when we put it on the camera, there we go. Anytime we take a picture, it's going to automatically advance for us, unless we set it to multi exposure. And in that case, it won't until we set it back and then it'll automatically advance after we're done with our multiple exposure. So that's how the motor drive back works. And again, as we can see, taking the dark slide out, you can see that the film is loaded correctly because the emulsion's there. And remember, you don't want to do that 
if you're using photo film you actually want to develop into photos. So unless you have a metered prism or the motor drive back, you're not going to need any batteries for this camera. So as it is, just out of the box, there's no batteries to change, no batteries to worry about having explode on you either. So that's always very nice. For using a flash on this camera, the lenses have a PC port on them right here. And so what you would need is a flash with a cable that you would plug into the lens and then a way to hold it, which would be something like a flash carrier that would screw into your tripod bushing down here to hold it off to the side. There's no hot shoe built into this camera to hold your flash. These were never intended to have flashes put directly on them, always to be used with flashes that connect through the PC port. The flash PC port has two types of flash it can use, X and M, and the switch is right here. You push down on the switch in the, a little bit and then you can switch between types of flash. X means modern, xenon, electronic flash. The X stands for xenon because that's a type of bulb. So M is a type of single-use flash bulb. If you're using a modern flash that you just buy online or even one of the Vivitars from the 1980s, it's an X flash. So bulbs really aren't made in a sort of economical way anymore. So you're going to want to just set this to X and leave it there un unless you have a stockpile of M-type bulbs you're using. And then the flash, because this is a leaf shutter, will fire at any shutter speed, even the fastest shutter speed. The reason for that is a leaf shutter, the leaves close, and they, they're at the, the, the point in the lens where the light rays are the most compact. Then when you take a picture, the leaves have to open completely into the back of, into the lens housing and then stop completely. At every shutter speed, they open and close. And then the, the timing is just a matter of how long they open and close for uh, when they do their, their process. So no matter what speed a flash, a leaf shutter fires at, the leaves have to entirely open and that's why the flash can be triggered because there's a very, very brief second, well, millisecond, where the entire film is always exposed to light with a leaf shutter at any speed. So that's a really nice thing about these RB cameras is that you can use a flash at any, at any shutter speed. So let's take a look at how to focus with this camera. What you're gonna do when you take a picture is you're gonna start by, well, the shutter has to be armed first. And you're gonna start by popping up the viewfinder cover. And you can rough, fo rough focus and frame this way if you want to. I 100% of the time use the magnifier on this camera. It just makes it a lot easier. When you peer through the magnifier, then you adjust these knobs on the side to find your focus. And that's, that's how you find your focus. There is a split prism in the middle which uses a, a diagonal line. And what that means is that there are two circular prisms. And if you find a straight line and you focus, that straight line is going to come together within that little tiny circle. When that straight line is together, that area, that plane of the straight line is in focus. The rest of the focusing mat you can use as a gauge. If you don't, want, if you don't have a, a, a straight line that you can focus on, either vertical or, or horizontal, that's one of the nice things about the diagonal line, is it works both with both types. You can look at the mat focusing screen just outside of that little prism area, and if something is in focus up here in the corner, let's say, it will be in focus on the film. So there are two different ways to focus with the stock screen. There were interchangeable screens you could get with focusing grids and things like that. And you can still get third-party focusing screens for these cameras. So uh, what we have here is just the standard diagonal split prism screen. For metering, you can either use a handheld light meter or the Sunny 16 rule, the Shady 8 rule, or the Indoor 4 rule. Those are three good ways. And Sunny 16 means if you have 400 ISO film, you set your shutter speed to 14, 400 and your shutter speed to 16. Shady 8, F8, Indoor 4, F4. Well, we can't quite get there with this lens. It only goes down to 4.5. Uh, indoor 2.8 is another good way of doing it. So that's, how, that's a way to meter without having an actual light meter uh, handy. Next thing we're going to do is talk about how to understand this focusing scale 
right here. All right, so here's the focusing scale on the side of the camera. The first thing you're gonna notice here, there are red numbers. Those are distances in feet. The white numbers are distances in meters. Then we've got hatch lines here on the silver bit. The black hatch lines correspond with either meters or both. And the red hatch marks correspond with feet. So this top red hatch mark there corresponds with uh, 15, 15 feet. This top black mark corresponds with infinity for both feet and meters. The second black mark corresponds with 10 meters and 30 feet. And then this third black mark corresponds with only five feet, 15, uh, five meters rather, 15 feet is that red one. So that's how you read this. If there's just a black mark, say at three meters and 10 feet, it's for both of them. Then over here we have a list of your lenses. These are all the different system lenses that were available for the RB67 at the time that this camera was released. I'm not sure if other focal lengths were made after this. If there's a focal length between two of these, then you can estimate based on what the calculator is going to tell you. Let's focus out a little bit here. Now, the further you move the lens away from the camera, the closer your focus is going to be. So if we move it out, what we can see here is that these lens focal distances have colors, and these lines here have colors. So there's a correlation there, and it's not an accident. We can also see that they're on these bricks here, these, these subway wall style bricks that have different patterns, and those patterns are presented down here along the bottom. This is a guide to tell you how much you need to compensate your exposure. So let's say at infinity focus, you've got 400 ISO film in, you set your shutter to f to 1 400th and your, your aperture to, to f16. That's great for infinity focus, but if you zoom all the way out with your lens, you're going to underexpose your image. That's because of the rule of inverse squares. What, the further you move your lens away, the less light is going to reach your film. And so when you get to a certain point, you then have to start compensating. I've got the 180 millimeter lens on here, which is in green. So if we count down from the top, orange, white, green, orange, white, green, this long line that goes all the way down there represents the 180 millimeter lens. If I had a 50 on, counting from the bottom, orange, well, the 50 is that first line right there. But we're gonna focus on this long green one. So let's say that my subject that I'm focusing at is is six feet away. Okay, and we know it's six feet away because that green line intersects that red hatch mark, which represents six feet. Now, if we look at the subway brick that is at that point right there, it looks like it's got a bunch of little pluses or dots, I don't know. Anyway, it looks like a snowfall at night. That means plus one half of a stop. You can tell that here. Solid black means zero, midnight snowfall means a half, Diagonal lines means one stop. So in order to get a proper exposure at this focal distance with this lens, I need to add a half stop of light, which means going to a click stop between F16 and F11 because there's no half stop shutter increment in the shutter speeds. Okay, if I focus even closer, let's say that I'm focused at the, the closest focusing distance possible. We're gonna keep following that line. It intersects with the red hatch mark, which means I'm focused at four feet away. And now here it is in this X pattern brick, which means one and a half stops. So instead of one 400th at F16, I need to give myself an extra one and a half stops. I have a lot of ways I could do that. I could go to one 250th on my shutter speed and then a click stop between F11 and F16, or I can go a stop and a half on the aperture and leave it at 1 400th, and then it'd be between f8 and f11 in, with my aperture setting. What this calculator does is tell you which lens you're using, how far your focus is, wh what your focus point is, and then what your exposure compensation is. This ties in with the aperture scale on the top of your lens. So for the sake of an example, we're gonna stick with the 180 for right now. We're gonna say that we are focused at six feet right here, okay? We don't have to worry about exposure compensation for this next bit. 
we're going to look at the exposure calculator. It's a little bit easier to see and read the exposure calculator on this lens, so we'll use this lens as an example. The process of calculating this is the same for everything. What we saw before was that we were focused at six feet. So that's in orange right here. We're gonna adjust that dial until we're at six feet. What this is telling us, this is our depth of field calculator. I misspoke when I said exposure calculator. If we were focused at F30, if we set the aperture to F32, everything from five feet to eight feet would be in focus. That's how we, we read that calculator. If we were focused at infinity, we could set infinity here and use F32, and then everything from 10 feet to infinity would be in focus. That's this lens's hyperfocal distance. These scales line up with the distances here, and so what you would use is the distance data off the calculator on the side, use your focusing distance to input it here, and once you line up your focusing distance with the orange line, then you know everything that will be in focus with your given aperture. That's how this calculator works. On the top of the lens here, we have an exposure value calculator. So if we know that at, let's say, 1 one one twenty fifth and f5.6, let's, just, let's say that this is a proper exposure. Well, there are other proper exposures you can use. If you selected f11, you would need to expand, you would need to stop your shutter down to 1 30th. And you can tell that because F11 here has a little line going above it to 1 30th of a second. If you went down to F22, you'd have to use F8, which means F16, which is in the middle, would have to use F1 15th of a second as your shutter speed. Likewise, if you went to F38, you, you couldn't quite get to 1 400th and have a proper exposure, so you'd have to go into the middle, which is 1 250th. So let's say that you're at 1 30th of a second and F8, and that's your proper exposure. Well, you could also open up to F3.8 and use 1 1 25th, or you could stop down to, one thir down to a F32 and use 1 half of a second. So whenever you have your correct settings lined up here around the red dot, you can look at other aperture options or other shutter speed options, connect the line that comes out of them to that corresponding aperture, and you could also use those settings. So that's how you read this calculator up here. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about is how to do mirror lockup with this camera. And in order to do that, you're going to need either a split style cable release like this, which has two cable releases coming off of it, and they fire in an order not at the same time, or you will need two standard cable releases like these ones right here. This seems like a good idea to use for mirror lockup on this camera, but I actually prefer to have two cable releases because it gives you more control over timing than this does. So I'm gonna set that off to the side, and if you're gonna use mirror lockup, just invest in a couple of these. They're, they're only a couple bucks, they're worth it if you don't have any. First thing we need to do is take the dial here and set it either from red to orange or uh, N to M, some of the lenses say. Here's the, uh, the 180. You can see on the 180 here where it says N and M, not mirror lockup or mirror lockup. So this one has a red dot and then it says mirror up. So we're gonna lift this and set it to mirror up then we're going to put a cable release in here. Okay, you can set that there. Next thing we need to do is put a cable release in the shutter button itself. And that's why you need two of these. You need one for the lens and one for the shutter. First thing that you need to do is trigger the shutter button on the camera. What that's gonna do is lift up the mirror and close down the leaf. So I'm gonna look through here, the leaf the leaf is closed, just have to take my word on that. Now the mirror is up. You can wait for a couple of seconds until all the, the shake gets out of the system. This is really good, for instance, if you wanted to do, to do star trails or a waterfall photo. Next, you're going to trigger the, the leaf shutter. There we go. The nice thing about having two of these is you can wait as long as you want between triggering the camera's shutter 
and the leaf, the leaf shutter in the lens. So mirror lockup is really good also for macro photography and things like that if you're, you're doing macro work. Basically anytime you want to ensure that there's no shake in the image from the internal mirror in the camera, mirror lockup is a really good way to do it. Okay, so let's go through the entire process of taking a picture with the RB67 so you can see what it looks like from start to finish. Okay, so let's pretend we have film loaded in here. First thing we want to do is take the dark slide out and we're going to set it over here in the side of the camera for protection. We'll pop up the viewfinder and the magnifier if you so choose, if I can make it pop up. There we go. Next thing we're going to do is focus. If you need to use a calculator on here to figure out your exposure, you can do that. Uh, after you've focused, if you're on a tripod, after you've focused, you'll take a meter reading and figure out what your best shutter speed and aperture combination is. Just verify your focus if you need to. Take your picture, advance your film, cock the shutter if you want to take another one. If you don't have a tripod, then what you want to do is figure out your settings first and then focus and then take a picture. And then again, advance and cock the shutter. Mechanically, it's a very simple process. The choices you make, whether you're in landscape mode or portrait mode, things like that, are 100% up to you, but the, the process of it is just trigger the shutter, advance the film, rearm the shutter. Double exposures are incredibly easy with the, the RB67 Professional. And the reason for that is if you take your first picture, like this, and rearm the shutter, you just take another one. You don't, the, the film advance is not linked to the shutter mechanism. The only exception to that, of course, is if you have the motor drive, and in that case, you want to set it to multi before you take your double exposure. So the mechanics of it are really simple. The science of it's a little bit more complicated. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that f8 and 1 60th of a second is our ideal setting for a single exposure. If you take a picture at that setting, it's going to be properly exposed, okay, with whatever the conditions are that we're working in. However, if you were to take two pictures at that setting, you would get double the light on the film as as you want for a proper exposure, meaning that your film would be way overexposed and you wouldn't get a good result. So you have to cut the amount of light in half when you do a double exposure. The easiest way to do that is with the shutter. Generally speaking, aperture, which controls depth of field, is going to be more important for your photo than your shutter speed. So if you want to have half as much light, you want to underexpose by one stop, which means going up from 1 60th to 1 25th. 1 1 25th. Or if you're 1 4th, means going to 1 8th. The reason is because even though this number is twice as high, it's a fraction, meaning that that shutter speed is half as fast as 1 60th. So half as much light will make it through the shutter as compared to 1 60th with the same aperture setting. So you'll take your first photo, rearm, take your second photo, and now you advance. And that's how you take a double exposure because this mechanism is not linked to this mechanism. It's very, very easy with this camera. The only warning you're gonna get is that you'll have a red, that little red tag right there telling you, hey, you're at risk of taking a double exposure. Just pay attention. So double exposure is super, super easy. The last thing that we're gonna talk about is the proper way to store a lens. I kind of touched on it earlier. Once you arm the shutter, then you can take the lens off of your camera. And if you're going to store your camera, what you want to do is then trigger the shutter and just set it off in the case to be stored. But there's still tension in the springs in this lens. So we push the button there down that's in the middle on the top and these two and let the lens trigger. And now you can store it. If these little pegs are next to the green dots, you do not want to store the lens. So you can put the lens cap on it and the rear lens cap on it and set it off to be stored. However, you will not be able to mount this on your lens, like on your camera rather, like this. The, the lens has to be armed to be mounted on the camera. 
So when you go to put this back on your camera in a few weeks or months, you need to rearm it. You push these down, and then the fun part begins of arming the lens. Now, after you bring your, your camera out of the storage box and you arm the, sh the shutter mechanism in it, you can remount the lens. There we go. If you have triggered the shutter, you will not be able to mount the lens. And the reason for that is because the shutter has these holes right here. You can see move when I arm the shutter. These have to be lined up with the lens. So if we trigger that, they're now out of alignment. One thing I've never tried, so let's try it right now, is if we can mount the lens with it disarmed while the camera's disarmed. And we can, which is nifty. So you can also do that. Uh, if your lens is, oh, but your lens will not come off of the camera if it is disarmed. You have to then arm it. So you can mount the lens if both the camera and lens are armed. And you can mount the lens if both the camera and lens are disarmed, but you cannot remove the lens if the camera is disarmed. So you may have noticed that your shutters have this time function right here. Time is like bulb, but works slightly differently. With bulb, you push the shutter button down and the shutter stays open as long as you hold that button. With time, you push the shutter button and it stays open until you mess with the shutter again. So if we look through the lens on time setting, we push the shutter button and now the, the shutter is just staying open. It doesn't close until we cock the shutter again and that ends the timed exposure. And because it closes as soon as we use the uh, arming on the, on the advance, uh, it's a really good way to take very long exposures. This allows you to take long exposures without the need for a cable release, or if you use a cable release, it's good because it, the cable release then just becomes a method by which you can eliminate uh, motion from the camera system when you take the long duration exposure. So that is it for the Mamiya RB67. This is a really, really fantastic, very nice camera that can take photos that are as good as you want it to take. They are robust, well-made, and you will build our muscles if you carry this around in the field. If this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track producing content which is helpful and useful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please put those below. I'm pretty good about checking on those every few days. If you have suggestions for future videos, please let me know. I'm more than happy to, to make those happen if I can. And one last very important thing, thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next videos.